Hi, my name is Dr. Min Kim. I'm a thoracic surgeon. Welcome to Pulmonology and Lung Surgery channel. Following is a grand rounds presentation at Houston Methodist Hospital on November 16, 2022. I'm very excited to kind of talk about the surgical management of lung cancer. There has been a lot of new changes that happened very recently within the past two years. And, um, you know, I think I gave this talk about five years ago, and everything I said five years ago somewhat applies, but not really. So it, it, it'd be kind of nice to give you an update. Um, so these are my disclosures. I typically, I basically do teaching for these companies. Um, I, I help uh, teach other surgeons and uh, other residents and fellows to understand how to use this uh, technology. So the goal of my talk is to talk about the epidemiology of lung cancer along with a diagnosis and some of the new technology we have to diagnose these patients with lung cancer, as well as staging and then um, ultimately treatment. So, and treatment paradigm has changed quite a bit uh, over the past several years. When we think about lung cancer uh, in the United States in 2022, um, there's about two, over 200 and about 30,000 patients are diagnosed with lung cancer uh, this year. And it's estimated that about 160,000 people are going to be die, uh, dying of lung cancer. Now, when we think about leading cause of cancer death in the United States, lung cancer is unfortunately one. It accounts for 130,180 estimated deaths this year, which is more than combined colorectal, breast, and prostate cancer. So this is uh, one of the deadliest cancers that we're de we, we encounter. But there is some good news. Um, in 1975, when Richard Nixon declared war on cancer, um, the estimated overall survival for patients, all patients who were diagnosed with lung cancer was about 13%. And we finally have gone to about 22% in 2015. I think this morning they announced that in 2018 it's gone up to 25% significant improvement, of, uh, although overall it's, it's not a great um, um, overall survival. The other trend that we're seeing is that we're seeing more patients being diagnosed with earlier stage cancer. Uh, uh, if you look at from 2017 to 2022, there has been an uh, increase in the localized uh, patients who are diagnosed with localized cancer. The overall survival for patients are or because a lot of patients were presented, uh, were diagnosed with a distant cancer by the time they were diagnosed. And this is uh, according to the National Cancer uh, Institute data. Another in interesting thing or exciting thing is that what's happening uh, compared to 2017 to 2022 in terms of overall survival based on the stage. And if you, you can see that overall survival for all kind of different stages of cancer have improved uh, significantly, and I think this contributes to the increase in survival in lung cancer. Now, my thoughts on why we're seeing this increase in survival um, over time, and I think there's four different things. One of them is lung cancer surveillance, and we'll talk about the data in terms of how this has significantly improved um, in, in the survival for lung cancer patients. And I'll also share some data on minimum invasive surgery. And then the two other things that's been exciting is the targeted therapy and as well as immunotherapy that has really changed in terms of cancer care for, uh, for uh, thoracic malignancies. Now, when we think about risk factor, the number one risk factor for lung cancer is smoking. So if you never smoke, the probability of that you'll can't get cancer is very, very low. 80% um, of the, the smoking, it's a personal history of smoking is attributed to, to lung cancer. The other risk factors are, uh, number two uh, risk factor is radon, it's an environmental exposure, and then the rest are smoking related. So secondhand smoking is recognized as a, one of the um, common cause of cancer. So if you talk to your patient, if they say, I've never smoked, and then you talk to them about, okay, when you're growing up, um, what was your kind of environment like? And they'll be like, well, you know, my parents smoked and I was kind of, I grew up in a smoky house or in the car, it was always smoking. So secondhand smoking is a, a significant factor. 
Um, asbestos exposure along with smoking is also a factor for lung cancer, as well as a personal history of getting having lung cancer. So in terms, I show that graph of uh, patients getting uh, earlier diagnosis of cancer, and all of that has um, somewhat contributed uh, due to uh, lung cancer screening. The issue with lung cancer is that by the time that patient has symptoms, they have stage four lung cancer or distant disease. Because if they have shortness of breath, usually they have pleural effusion, and then if you investigate, that's pretty much the cancer has gone beyond the lung itself to the pleural space. So, um, so patients typically don't have symptoms when they have earlier stage cancer, and the one of the kind of biggest things that we've worked on in the past two decades is trying to see if the lung cancer screening would be helpful. And this was the kind of the first study to show the impact of lung cancer screening. So this was a national lung cancer screening trial. Uh, it was a multi-center um, randomized control trial, which it, it provides the best data in terms of what's the impact of this, this tool. So they looked at the high-risk uh, group of patients who were smokers and former smokers, and then they compared two groups of patients. Either you had screening uh, with chest X-ray yearly for over three years, or if they, um, or you underwent low-dose CT scan. And then two big questions that they wanted to answer was that, are you going to be able to detect more patients with lung cancer? And then um, did the mortality from lung cancer, uh, what was the impact of the screening in uh, mortality, uh, for the mortality of lung cancer? And this was the result. And, and this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And what they were able to show that low dose CT scan, you were able to diagnose more patients with lung cancer. And then when they looked at the death from lung cancer, patients who had screening had uh, with a CT scan had significantly less um, death compared to patients who only had chest X-ray. Rel relative reduction of lung cancer mortality was 20%. And this study, along with the study uh, that was performed in Europe, have shown that there is a significant benefit of undergoing uh, surveillance if you're a high-risk patient. So over, uh, it, it, since that trial was published, there has been kind of debate as to which group to, um, which group is that high-risk patient. And CMS recommendation for 2022 uh, basically says that age 50 to 77, um, 20 pack year smoking history, current smoker, and then former smoker who quit within the last 15 years. So this is a group of patients who should undergo screening. Um, now I think, obviously original study was for, for uh, three years, but uh, for now the recommendation is that if you, fit into this category, you should be getting screening every year um, with low-dose CT scan. Now, once you have an abnormality on the CT scan, the next question is that, well, can we diagnose that patient with, um, it, it well, try to figure out what that is. So one of the things that we use is a CT scan. Um, we take the information about the patient, their usually smoking history, their age, um, their ex different exposures, and try to get an estimate, a clinical estimate about the patient risk. And then we take that information along with the, what we see on the CT scan. There are a couple of things that we look at in CT and say, well, it, that's gonna be cancer. So uh, definitely a size of the, the lesion, the nodule. So if the nodule is less than four millimeters, you, you won't worry as much compared to the nodules about two point, uh, greater than two centimeters. So the increase in size, you think about higher risk of it being cancer. Speculation is something else that, that makes us worry that it might be cancer as well as the growth of the uh, size of the uh, mass over time. Now calcification is uh, one of those things that if you see calcification, 
that typically indicates that it's an old infection and the probability of it being cancer is, is lower. So we look for non-calcified can- um, lesions for thinking it might be cancer. The other uh, tool that it, if the, that imaging is suspicious enough, um, we would go ahead and um, get PET-CT. The PET-CT is a very good diagnostic tool. It increases sensitivity and specificity for diagnosis of, can- of the lung cancer, and then also kind of gives you a sense of you know, if it has metastasized to any different areas. There are a couple caveats of uh, um, using the PET-CT. It's not the only tool, and then there's, there's a couple things like if the lesion is less than one centimeter, it doesn't really, um, it might be not as beneficial, and then the certain type of uh, lung cancer is not a very avid, but overall it's, it's a very good tool. So we take the information about the patient, we take the information from the imaging, and then we make an assessment as to how likely that this is going to be cancer. So if, if the nodule is, it looks like low risk, someone with a, something like seven millimeter nodule um, that you're seeing and it's not really speculated, then you might just say, well, okay, let me just do another interval scan. Or if patient presents with a lung nodule and had um, concomitant uh, pneumonia at the time, you might say, well, the probability that this might be something might be low, let me just get another imaging. So that's kind of the kind of standard um, algorithm. If patient has moderate risk, then we uh, typically go for a biopsy. If patient is a high risk, we kind of assess if this is going to be like an early stage or really late stage. So if patient has high risk, likely cancer, and has mets everywhere, on the imaging, you might say, well, most likely stage four, let's get a biopsy and then we'll, we'll treat the patient appropriately. But if it's really early um, stage, maybe say it's a two centimeter nodule in the peripheral that's speculated, that's gotten bigger over time with a SUV of eight, the probability of that not being cancer is really low. So we might undergo something called surgical biopsy and then treat at the time of surgery. So, and, and this is, um, you know, unfortunately, I don't have. It, it's a little bit of kind of the 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 imaging uh, patient history that kind of helps us put you into these particular category. Um, one of the things that we've developed at Houston Methodist is a suspicious lung cancer. Um, sorry, suspicious lung nodule conference, where we have radiologists, pulmonologists, and thoracic surgeons come together every week to review these cases and then put them into these categories and provide uh, kind of recommendations in terms of how to best follow these group of patients. Now, in terms of biopsy, you can biopsy these lung nodules, either transthoracic, uh, meaning through the uh, chest from the outside to inside, or transbronchial from the inside. And this has been really interesting in terms of development over time. And one of the questions that, that we can ask is that which modality has highest diagnostic yield with lowest complication rate? Um, yeah, transthoracic biopsy is simply, um, it's done with a CT guided modality. Uh, it's performed by interventional radiologist or diagnostic radiologist, and it's performed on an awake patient. And diagnostic yield is about 70 to 80%. And then you can see this needle kind of going into this mass. The issue is that you do have a higher pneumothorax rate. Like if you take all patients undergoing a CT guided, you are going to get about 30 to 50 percent of patients developing a pneumothorax. A lot of them you don't have to um, intervene. A lot of them you kind of watch, and then usually the body will be able to reabsorb it. Um, chest replacement rate is about five percent. Now the other. Uh, options that has been developed are transbronchial. Uh, the thing about the lung is that you have airway that can go to different parts of the lung, and the question is that, well, can we biopsy uh, using that modality? And it's been really interesting in terms of the development. The, the electromagnetic navigation has been the, the, kind of the, the core technology that's been used to, to kind of get you to that lesion. And the first uh, one that developed was something called triple dimension bronchoscopy, um, where you use the electromagnetic navigation and you're get, guiding a catheter or sheath to the lesion that, of interest to help you do a biopsy. 
Varen is a similar kind of technology, except that the, every instrument, like a needle that's going to go in and get that biopsy sample, has the sensor in it. So that's a difference. And in terms of Monarch, is that robotic platform that's somewhat similar to the super dimension, um, kind of helps you guide that catheter in a more um, fluid way to, to do that biopsy. The other technology is something called shape sensing technology. So what this group has done was uh, looking at the airway and say, well, airway, you can, if you visualize it, that there's a certain shape that it will develop at different parts of the lung. Um, and then using that technology to help you guide to the lesion. So it's not using that, that electromagnetic navigation. Now this is a, the Monarch uh, robotic platform, which is really kind of interesting in terms of um, what you do. Uh, I don't know if anyone knows Xbox, but they, that's actually, they're using the Xbox controller, and uh, you're guiding this catheter down the airway and using the electromagnetic field, and then you're looking at, you can actually visualize where you're going, and then you slowly get to the area, and then um, you biopsy the lesion. And that's kind of the ideal, the platform. The, so the steps of this procedure is that you, you first you get a CT scan, uh, kind of high resolution CT scan of the patient that helps you using their software to create a virtual lung. And then you uh, get the patient intubated and place in the patient in an electromagnetic field, and there's usually a field generator. And then you are matching the virtual and real anatomy using bronchoscopy to gather some more data. And then you navigate and you biopsy to, the, to that lesion. The issue with this is that there's some uh, diagnostic yield has been a little bit challenging. We were hoping it would be much better, but I would say about 56% overall if you look at all the different literature. Uh, but the pneumothorax rate is really low. The probability of that you're going to get pneumothorax is, is very rare with this. Now, let me talk about this new technology called transbronchial shape sensing uh, technology. It's called ION. And this is um, what that looks like. It's, it, it, um, it, it's on a cart and then uh, and the interesting thing about this technology is that they spend a lot of time um, you know, making sure that you have a smaller catheter. This is 3.5 millimeters, so you can actually get to the peripheral of the lung and using, using the shape technology. But the thing about this is that they spend a lot of time integrating it with imaging. So you have this robotic technology that's using a technology to kind of visually kind of get to the lesion. Um, and using the kind of the shape sense technology. But the, you know, the first version, it was, I was like a little bit challenging because you know, each of the technology has its pluses and minuses. But the, the real integration is that being able to use it with other imaging modality at the time that you're doing this biopsy. So this is the uh, real case. So I'm at the lesion and this is a, uh, C arm X-ray. You can see you can see the tip of catheter here. And in this modality, what we're doing is that we're using radial endobronchial ultrasound, and then we're guiding that down. And then here, you can actually see that I'm right in the lesion, right? And then I can confirm it with a C arm saying I'm there. <laughs> so this is really cool. But um, you know, I thought this was cool, but let me show you what else you can do with this technology. So this is something called Cone Beam CT. Um, it's, uh, I, I think we're the, one of the new, like, uh, first institution where we have the incorporation of this ion technology with the, this kind of uh, um, Cone Beam CT. And it's basically a C-arm, but what they do is that they'll spin the C-arm around the patient while patient I have a catheter in there, and now needle cell, and then we do the spin, and it generates this imaging, and you can see my needle in the nodule in the real time. And this spin takes about maybe three or four minutes. So you're not spending a huge amount of time acquiring this imaging. You get to the lesion, you put the needle based on the kind of the 
technology they have, and then I can use the ultrasound to confirm that I'm there, and then I can use comb beam CT to ensure that my needle is actually there. Uh, and this is kind of, you're, you're taking this technology to the next level um, so that we can get high, you know, better answers for our patients. So this is a uh, abstract that was presented at, at, at a chess meeting, um, one of the uh, earlier um, groups who kind of integrated this comb beam CT along with the shape sensing technology. Um, their pneumothorax rate was 0%, and then their diagnostic yield was 94%. I mean, that is pretty impressive in terms of what we can do. Now, um, so in my opinion, <laughs> this is, uh, I think ION with comb beam CT is probably the way that we're going to be going, moving forward for our patients. Uh, it, you can pretty much reach anywhere in the, in the lung with this, and then the, the being able to kind of have that real-time imaging is going to make a big difference with a higher yield. Now, let's talk about the surgical biopsy. What we used to do in the past is that, I mean, and I think currently you can still use this, is that if patient has a small nodule, you know, kind of hard to locate, what we say, well, let's do a thoracotomy. We're going to feel for this, okay? And then if we feel it, and then we're going to remove it. And it's, you know, it's the open thoracotomy, or people say mini thoracotomy to kind of get your finger in there to feel it. It's really hard to do with the, um, you know, with VAT technology. But with a VAT and we call it RAS, a robot assisted technology, we we're thinking, well, is there a better way instead of making a thoracotomy to just be able to do a surgical biopsy? So there's different modalities in terms of being able to kind of localize these small lesions. So the, the question is that um, which of the modalities that we have um, that can provide best efficacy and accuracy in localizing the lesion um, when you have a small lesion that, and then you also want to do it in a minimum invasive fashion. So let me talk to you about the C CT localization because this is something that, that a lot of people do. So for a patient, and this is a small like a GGO that we worry they might be cancer, um, this patient went to the CT scanner, the radiologist placed a needle. Um, patient had a needle kind of, skin, you know, with a dressing on and sitting in the pre-op. And then we went to the OR, you can see that the, the needle is in the lesion and then we did the wedge resection of it and then this patient had an anocarcinoma, so we ended up doing the resection. The advantage of this is that it, you get this very accurate localization but the, uh, it's very uncomfortable for the patient. So sometimes the needle falls out, and then you're like, well, why do we do that, <laughs> right? And then um, the other way to do this is that we can do it intraoperatively. We have a hybrid suite at Walter Tower where we, we can do basically a, a Dyna CT. The challenge with that modality was that it took about one or two hours to kind of get that diagnostic uh, part, which was very time consuming on top of if you're going to do a, either a robotic or VAT lobectomy. So that was somewhat challenging. So we've gone to this platform called SpinPerk, uh, intraoperative transthoracic localization. It's a, it's a um, kind of mouthful. But if you think about it, there's, um, this is what we do for this particular technology. We obtain a CT of the chest with a lesion side up. So if you have a left sided, like suspicious lung nodule, you're going to have the left sided up on the CT scan. We intubate the patient and the position of the patient on the, on the kind of how we're going to do the operation, and then place the patient in the electromagnetic field, and then you match the real and uh, virtual imaging. And then this is kind of the real time. You can see the screen, and, um, and all the residents who's been on the service knows that you're trying to get that plus crossbar on the, on, the, on the lesion itself. And once you know where it is, you kind of mark it with a die, entry site. And then that's exactly what you want to see. Um, and then we use that technology to uh, put this needle into the lesion itself and we mark it with dye. So we use 0 0.4, 0 0.4 of ICG and methylene blue. And then we do the surgery. So let me show you a patient. Uh, this is a patient with a um, with a lesion that was suspicious in the lingula. 
So this is a scan that was done on the, uh, the left side up. And then you can see this lesion right there. So we use the technology to uh, pinpoint it. You can see here is a lesion. We put the needle and then we marked it with a dye. And then this is us doing the, the robotic localization. You can actually see where the, the, the methylene blue has gone into. And then ICG, you can see where the area has marked. Um, and then we use the, uh, the robotic platform to perform the wedge resection. And the thing about the uh, robotic platform is that you have this ability to see the uh, methylene blue dye. It's, a, it's the ICG. Um, the, the fluorescence is uh, integrated. Um, it's function called Firefly, where you can just turn it on and you can see where the uh, ICG happens. Um, it doesn't really translate as well here because of the, um, the 2D view, but 3D you can see where it, where it is located. So that ended up being a carcinoid tumor, and we ended up doing a lobectomy for that patient, uh, and then we're able to get that intraoperative diagnosis. So when you look at this, the data, and this is one of the earlier data um, in this um, series, they did a retrospective analysis in terms of their group's experience. They really went after smaller nodules. The median size of their nodule was about 13 millimeters, located about 10 millimeters from the pleura. And then they were able to successfully localize for 94% of, of the patients. Um, we've had really good experience. I think we we're one of the biggest uh, centers who have used this technology as mainstay in terms of how we localize small nodules. Um, and uh, Dr. Chan's working on that series, <laughs> along with Sean, I think. Okay, so, yeah. So when they did it, and then they removed the lesion, and they didn't see the lesion. So they had to do other modalities to um, try to find the lesion. So that was, and and this was a very small early series. And then I think you know once we mature, uh, we'll get more data in terms of how effective this is. We're also doing a multi. We're involved in a um, multi-center registry trial, uh, looking at this question. And, um, and we're one of the participants. So we'll see, when that comes out, we'll see the efficacy rate. But so far, I mean, we've, you know, and our, my experience has been, been very good, or our collective experience in our group. So in our sense, I, I think we like the spin perk localization because it is very quick. So we get the patient intubated position, and then we can mark it, and then we can actually remove it. So the patient doesn't have, have that uh, preoperative uh, modality, and then we don't really have to convert to like a thoracotomy, put our hands in, and things like that. Now, in terms of staging, it's very. I don't think this has changed uh, a bit. Um, so, like I said, we do a CT and a PET CT first, and then we kind of uh, assess uh, based on the those two imaging uh, about the primary tumor. So, first, the size of the primary tumor, if it's uh, greater than three centimeters, or any of the lymph nodes are concerned for uh, positive lymph nodes. So the chest uh, CT shows that the lymph node is greater than centimeter, uh, either hilar or mediastinal, or if there's any pedividity, then you have to do something more, uh, invasive mediastinal staging or MRI of the brain, and the MRI of the brain. Okay, so that's how we complete the staging for this group. Um, if patient has just metastatic disease, then obviously we just need an MRI of the brain because and after you get the diagnosis. Um, if you have primary tumor that's less than three centimeters, that's in the peripheral, um, then well, all you need is CT of the chest and, and uh, PET CT in terms of staging. So in terms of treatment of non-small cell lung cancer, uh, I am not going to talk about small cell lung cancer. That's another kind of topic, but um, about 80% of the cancer out there for lung cancer is non-small cell, which is mainly adenocarcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma. And we look at, and the first thing we do is, that, is the patient a surgical candidate, and we look, assess that based on the pulmonary function. Uh, we like their FEV1 and DLCO to be above 40% after lung resection, and then we stratify their cardiac risk factors. And if, once they're surgical candidate, then we look at surgical options. 
The first question that, that I want to answer for you is that should a patient with early stage lung cancer undergo minimally invasive surgery? Okay. Um, I think we're all a believer here, but <laughs> I just want to show you some data. So this is a really interesting uh, study that uh, was uh, published in Journal of Clinical Oncology in 2009. And what they did was a systemic review with meta-analysis of randomized and non-randomized trial comparing VATS, a video assisted thoracoscopy, lobectomy, and open lobectomy. And so two groups were all clinical stage one, VATS versus open. And what they want to know is that was there a higher recurrence rate? Uh, in one without the other, or and then if there's any difference in five-year survival. And really interesting thing about this was that if you did open a VAT, there was no real difference in terms of local recurrence. However, if if you look at systemic uh, uh, recurrence, patients with who underwent VAT lobectomy had less um, recurrence uh, outside of that local regional field. And then if you looked at the five-year survival, there was a, a better five-year survival of patients undergoing bat lobectomy, which was somewhat shocking. And everyone's like, ugh, what does that mean? Um, and I think you know, it, it's been probably uh, about 13 years since that has been published. I think there's two things that people attribute to it. And it, this is really hard to kind of uh, do a randomized control trial on. But <laughs> the thing about bat lobectomy is that you typically take the vein first. And um, there are studies showing that there are circulating tumor cells that are seen um, coming from the tumor going into the vein uh, when you're manipulating the tumor. So, um, uh, so when you do surgery, perhaps if you take the vein first, that might be beneficial. The other kind of argument is that, that when you manipulate the tumor, so the concept is that when you do open, you're manipulating the tumor somewhat more so than when you do it in a minimally invasive fashion. So those are the uh, kind of the two kind of concepts. So uh, I think minimum invasive is great. And then when you think about minimum invasive, there's two different modalities. There's something called VATS, which is using a video stick. Um, and then there's a newer technology called robot assisted. Um, we looked at our series in terms of the impact of that DaVinci XI robot. I, we, the XI robot was truly built for thoracic surgery. All the versions before was just not, not was not really created for thoracic. <laughs> but XI was a, kind of developed for thoracic surgery as well as colorectal surgery. And once we implemented it, we looked at our, our uh, data. Um, one of the residents of Boston looked at our data, looking at uh, 504 patients, where we had different periods. So it was predominantly VAS, and we did do robotic. This was SI platform, and then initial robot experience and mature robot experience about uh, from 2012 to 2019. And what we found was that there was significant improvement in uh, post-op events, went from 22% down to 16 to 8.2% major events. Uh, length of stay was lower, two days. And then 30-day remission rate down to 1.9%. So. From our standpoint, wow, I mean, this technology has really changed in terms of how um, the patients do uh, after a pulmonary resection. And then uh, Anuj spent a lot of time looking at uh, our uh, concept of self-assisting. So another benefit of a robot is that you don't really need an assistant to help you complete the uh, uh, anatomic lobectomy. So, Fast lobectomy, you really need a skill assistant, or it's helpful having a skill assistant to complete a lobectomy. So he looked at the kind of outcome. It's a retrospective cohort. We compare the fast experience to robot experience, um, but also compared to the national database as well, looking at some of the kind of technical outcomes. And when we did a propensity match about robotic lobectomy and VATS lobectomy, we had significantly less conversion rate. We went to 0% of conversion. Any complication went, a rate went down from 50 to 24% length of stay. And this is a median length of stay, went to two days compared to four days, and then mortality was 0%. And then this could be because we were just really bad, bad lobectomy surgeons, which could be. And so we <laughs> compared it to the national database and said, you know what? <laughs> Uh, how are we doing? So the conversion rate was about 0% compared to VATS, which is about 8%. Uh, 
uh, any complication rate was still less, 23% compared to 37%. And then length of stay, this is an average with 3.1% at uh, 3.1 days compared to 6.6 .6 days. And then once again, no significance. It was lower mortality, but no significance statistically. So overall, we think that the robotic platform has really helped patients um, to uh, recover better from this um, operation. So should patients undergo early stage lung cancer, uh, uh, patients un <laughs> undergo minimally invasive surgery for lung cancer? My answer is yes, and you should do robot assisted surgery. Okay. Um, we currently have done about 2,523 cases as a group, and this is when we got the Da Vinci XI, and this has been a very exciting addition to our, um, our group to help our patients. Um, and we were ranked number 18 uh, for the pulmonary and lung surgery, and then uh, lung cancer surgery at our institution is a high performing, according to U.S. News and World Report. Now, the next question is that how much lung do you have to remove? And this has been, um, you know, answer to that is that it depends, right? So the better question is, if you have a patient with clinical stage one lung cancer with a tumor that's less than two centimeters in the periphery, what should we do? And we actually have an answer for you uh, as of this year. <laughs> um, there's two studies that came out uh, the past two years. One of them was looking at peripheral ground glass opacity with greater than 50% solid component, and the other one is peripheral lung cancer. And I'll go over this because this is somewhat game changer for us. So this is that first study, segmentectomy versus basically lobectomy uh, in a small size peripheral non-small cell lung cancer multi-center open label phase three randomized control non-inferiority trial. So the whole point of the trial was that it's not worse, right? And then um, it was less than two centimeters. Initially, the solid component has to be greater than 25%, and then uh, in the mid-trial, they went to 50% based on the new data. And what they want to look, look at was the overall survival. Um, before this, the standard of care was lobectomy. So the question is, that, well, is segmentectomy okay? And, but this is a, a study in Japan, and the, their group, uh, and you know, what they looked at were, were these peripheral tumors. These were the inclusion and exclusion criteria for this. And then for lobectomy, what they had to do was perform a lobe and then do a hyalur mediastinal lymph node dissection. You cannot do a bilobe. So if the cancer crossed from upper lobe to lower, middle lobe, you cannot do that. And then margin has to be less than the maximal tumor, if margins less than maximal tumor size or less than two centimeters, they have to get an intrap frozen. And if frozen is positive, then they have to do more of more like a wedge resection. Yeah, for segmentectomy, it has to be one or two segments. Um, they did uh, left trisegmentectomy was considered okay uh, because that's usually everyone thinks that that's two segment anyway. Um, no basal segmentectomy. And then if uh, macroscopically positive lymph node, then they had to do a lobectomy. So that, that was their trial design. And then afterwards, pathologic 1B, 2, and 3A, this is a seventh edition in terms of category. They all received a chemotherapy. This is standard care in Japan, and they follow up for five years. And when you look at their data, it's pretty well balanced in terms of group. But one of the things that you have to notice, the animal carcinoma rate is about 90%. And the Japan, in Japan, there has a lot more tumors that are GGO that has become a solid component, which behaves somewhat a little bit better. So, so you know, this is something that you have to be a little bit mindful when you read this study. But a huge number of patients, 554 surgical trial in each arm, that's pretty impressive. And what they were able to do was mostly minimum invasive baths, 89% and 90%, and then no real big difference in terms of the lymph node uh, resection. And what they found was that, what you expect, uh, stage 1A was about 82% to 84% segmentectomy, and no real big difference in terms of a pathologic stage. And this is somewhat exciting data. Um, the segmentectomy patients actually did better in terms of overall survival. But when they looked at why people, um, what was the cause of their death, it was not related to cancer. So all of those patients in the lobectomy who, who passed away was not related to cancer. Now, if you look at the recurrence-free survival, no difference, okay? So 
they looked at secondary outcomes. This was really interesting. They were thinking that if you do segmentectomy, patients are going to breathe better or have a better pulmonary function. So when they looked at it in 12 months, uh, it was only 3.5% improvement. So they, it didn't really meet their criteria of 10% improvement. Um, but the, in terms of complication rate and difference, in, there's no difference in survival. The other trial that came out was that um, this is, was presented by Dr. El Torque at the International Association of Study on Lung Cancer World Conference in Vienna over the summer. It was a randomized controlled trial. This is a trial that we've been waiting for a long time. It's a CalGB 140503. It was less than two centimeter peripheral tumor at the lobectomy of sublobar where you can do a wedge. And 60% of patients had a wedge resection. And then in order to be enrolled, you have to do a station 10 and two media sound lymph node. They have to be negative. And if so, then you did randomize to do two different groups. And what they found was that there was no difference in terms of disease risk survival, and then no difference in overall survival. It's, uh, this is somewhat of a game changer. It ha it's not been published, so we have to look at the details of the study. But um, I think we can kind of answer this question uh, based on these two studies that if you have a peripheral less than two centimeter uh, non-small cell lung cancer, then we should do intraoperative or preoperative hyalur and media sound lymph node biopsy. If it's negative, then we can consider wedge or segment and then do a lobectomy if it's positive. Now, if it's between two and four centimeters, what should we do? Uh, it's clinical stage one. The recommendation is still going back to the uh, lung cancer trial group, randomized controlled trial from 1995 that showed that lobectomy was better. So we perform lobectomy for this group. Um, so, lobectomy with mediastinal lymph node sampling or dissection. Next is that patients with uh, greater than four centimeter stage one B. Uh, this, this is stage one B greater than four centimeter is now stage two in the new uh, category. But all the studies were kind of done in a stage one B greater than four, so that's why I'm referencing it that way. In terms of adjuvant therapy, there's been two exciting trials. This is uh, using the immunotherapy in the in the groups between the, um, either you get resected 1B to 3A, and then all of them got chemotherapy, and the question was that if you add immunotherapy, if they made any difference in terms of survival. And it, it does. So after you have a resected stage 1B to 3A, you should get chemo, and then followed by immuno. Significant improvement in overall survival. And then, um, uh, yeah, both the patients with the PDL1 greater than and overall survival for all patients. The next question was the, uh, the immunotherapy doesn't really work great for EGFR positive mutated patients. So the question was that, well, is there any benefit for using the targeted therapy for EGFR? And then they randomized as group placebo or, or the, uh, I'm not going to say it. <laughs> and then what they found was that there's significant improvement with uh, getting the three years of the uh, EGFR targeted therapy. So, does, do they uh, should they receive adjuvant? Yes. And the um, this is what we should do. So, patients with greater than uh, stage one B, greater than four centimeter to three A, you check the EGFR status. And if it's po negative, then you should get immunotherapy. If it's positive, then you should get the targeted therapy. Yeah, next question is, the, um, does patients with a clinical uh, stage 1B greater than 4 centimeters to 3A, should they get induction therapy, right? And this was um, kind of one of the things that, that was controversial until this paper. Uh, this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, this year. It's a randomized controlled trial looking at chemo, induction chemotherapy or chemo with immunotherapy. Okay, to the front arms. And what they looked at was disease-free survival and also the pathological complete response rate. And if you receive nimolutabab plus chemo, you had better disease-free survival. But the, this is a more exciting thing. So if you receive that and then you had surgical resection, 24% of those patients did not have any cancer at all. There are very few things in life that's going to give you this in lung cancer fight, right? And this is very, like, game changer uh, when I saw this.
So does patients with clinical stage 1B greater than 4 centimeters with the 3A uh, benefit from neoadjuvant? Answer is yes, and I think this is what we should be doing. Clinical stage 1B in this group uh, should get chemo with immunotherapy, and then you should undergo surgery within three weeks. Okay, I mean, sorry, within six weeks. So in conclusion, uh, smoking, I hope, I, like, if you can take one thing out of this, is that smoking is bad. <laughs> That's it, it's very simple. Uh, it, but it is the main cause of lung cancer, uh, and lung cancer is number one, uh, the uh, cancer-related death in the United States. Uh, surveillance CT, encourage surveillance CT for all of your patients who are high risk. And if you are ever going to get lung cancer surgery, everyone's going to get what? Robotic surgery. Okay, thank you. All right. And then, <laughs> and then these are recommendations, less than two centimeters. If it's a peripheral, then I think you can do sublobar. Um, if patient with a pathologic greater than 1B, uh, greater than four centimeters, you should check EGFR status and then either target or immuno. And then lastly, if the resectable clinical 1B, you should get induction chemo and immunotherapy. Um, with that, you know, I always like to thank my partners because I cannot be here <laughs> without my partners. And I have a fantastic partners, uh, Ed and Ray, and Kat, Dr. Gray, who's joined us this year. It's, it's been fantastic. And then my thoracic group is phenomenal. I don't think uh, I have a better staff. Um, Leo, Hannah, Jane, uh, and Elaine, and Jeanette, Alicia, and Susanna has been fantastic to help us grow our thoracic program here. And then I also like to thank you know, Dr. Gaber, my boss, who kind of has been very supportive of our program, as well as Natali, uh, Roberta, Michael, and Kathy. Um, Ed and Duke does a lot of help in terms of kind of analyzing our data, um, as well as Zoe, Kelly, and Daryl and Aisha, who helps with the clinical trial, and all of you, the residents. <laughs> and, and thank you for helping with all our projects. It's been fantastic uh, to bring our mission forward, but also helping taking care of our patients, uh, as well as uh, Leanne, Patty, Kat, Kevin, and Louise Rose, and all our nurses and scrub techs. All right, so next questions. 